Okay, this is The Outsiders Part 2. Uh, I started last week. This is just a two-week series, and I began last week um, by talking about who we are, what we're about, what we say, why we say the things that we say here at the sanctuary. I think it's important for us to know who we are and why we exist. Uh, we don't claim to be better than everybody else, obviously. In many ways, we're worse. Uh, but we are. The God is doing something unique here, something that I'm happy to be a part of. And so I always take a couple of weeks at the beginning of each new year to sort of describe who we are and what we're about. Uh, and this week, I want to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I'm going to read verses 1 through 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 to 5. This is the Apostle Paul writing these things. Now, I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. They are being tested by many troubles, and they are very poor, but they are also filled with abundant joy, which has overflowed in rich generosity. For I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more, and they did it of their own free will. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift for the believers in Jerusalem. They even did more than we had hoped. For their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and to us, just as God wanted them to do. So last week I said that in 2019, Stacy and I moved here, and we didn't move here to start some kind of religious group. We didn't come here to build some big church. I had been a part of that in the past, and I didn't want to do that. I wasn't feeling called to do that. I had no desire to do that. What we came here to do was to start a recovery place for humans, which is why you've heard me say, I said it last week and I'll keep saying it, uh, that the sanctuary is a recovery place masquerading as a church. And I think that makes us unique in some ways. And we operate, as I mentioned last week, under the assumption that we're all in recovery, every single one of us. We've all been hurt and disappointed. We all have fears and insecurities. We've all felt unloved and rejected in some way. We're all broken. And therefore, we all have unhealthy relationships with something or someone that we depend on to soothe the pain, to make us feel strong and secure and safe, important loved, in control. We're all attached to something we think we need in order to be happy and safe and content. So your addiction may not be alcohol, but it may be getting approval. It may not be getting high, but it may be getting respect. It may not be sex, but it may be getting attention for the way you look or for your professional achievements. It may not be food, but it may be financial stability. It may not be nicotine, but it may be feeling important. It may not be social media, but it may be the need to be in control, to manage your image. All of us are drunk on something. None of us are stone cold sober. None of us. So there's two types of people in the world, like I said last week, people in recovery who know they are and people in recovery who think they're not. But if you're human, you're recovering. We're all in. We're all a part of this. One thing we could all learn from the recovery community, in my opinion, and I think the church absolutely needs to pay attention to this, is that what qualifies someone to help a group of broken down people is to be broken down themselves. We cannot help someone in the dark if we're not keenly acquainted with the dark ourselves. It's impossible. You'd never, for instance, find a non-alcoholic leading an AA meeting. In fact, what qualifies a person to lead a meeting is his or her own struggle with alcohol. Now, in the Catholic tradition, a priest who is dismissed for indiscretions is referred to from that point on as a spoiled priest. And I, I wrote this recently. What's interesting is that in some of the old Irish Catholic stories, when someone's life went off the rails, often those people would not go to the official Catholic priests for help or guidance or confession. 
They would seek out the spoiled priests because those men knew what it meant to be damaged goods. They were well acquainted with the darkness. They knew they were broken. It wasn't that they were still holding on to God, but that they were believing that God was still holding on to them. I love that because a spoiled priest, that's, that's who I am. And that God holds us, that is the only message you will hear from me. In my messages, if you haven't noticed by now, um, I'll never tell you what to do. I'll never tell you how to live your life. Uh, and that may seem very strange because we live in a time when self-help and life coaching is all the rage. And so a lot of people think it's the job of a preacher to tell them what to do and how to live. In fact, preaching today has almost become synonymous with tell people how to live, tell people what to do. But that's not the way it's supposed to be. I mean, think about it for a minute. Most of us know what we should be doing and what we shouldn't be doing, how we should be living. I mean, most of us know this. We're not ignorant to these things. Most of us know that we need to be better at loving others, that we need to be less distracted and more present. We know that. Most of us know that lying and stealing is bad, that adultery and selfishness and jealousy and laziness are bad. We know that stuff. Most of us know that being patient and kind and loyal and generous and empathetic and sacrificial is good, that those things are good, that those are the things we should be pursuing. We should be about those things. Most of us know that bullying and greed and pride and self-pity and breaking promises are bad, that gossiping and ingratitude and rudeness isn't good. You don't need to be told that stuff. You know it. So do I. We know we should probably pray more, encourage other people more, forgive quicker, trust God more. We all know that stuff. We know these things. In fact, the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 2 that God's law is written on our hearts, that our consciences bear witness to what's right and wrong, what's good and bad, what's true and false. So our problem is not that we don't know what to do. Our problem is that we don't do it. That's our problem. So from time to time, I'll get pressure from people to talk more about what we need to be doing and I always sort of push back a little bit gently, sometimes not so gently if they're being obstinate, but gently uh, and say, what is it that you're unclear about? What is it specifically that you would like me to tell you to do that you're confused about? And you know what to do and what not to do. I mean, people who go to church or don't go to church, they know these things. They know that things like lying and stealing and adultery and selfishness and all, they know that stuff isn't good. Our problem is not that we don't know these things. Our problem is that we don't do these things. That's the problem. Our problem is that we know what's good and right and true and pure, and we often do the opposite. This is what Paul meant in Romans 7 when he said, the good I know I should do, I don't do. And the bad things that I know I shouldn't do, I, I keep on doing. Okay, this is the plight of the human condition. In other words, our problem is not a lack of information. It's not a lack of knowledge regarding what's right and wrong. Our problem is a heart problem. It's not a behavior problem. So I'll never tell you what to do. I'll never spend the little time that I have up here on a weekly basis telling you how to live or what to do. Because I'm assuming you pretty much know those things already, that your problem is, just like my problem, we often do the opposite. Like the Apostle Paul, we say, man, the things I know I shouldn't do, I just, I keep doing that stuff. And the things I know I should do, those qualities that I should be pursuing, I typically don't. In fact, Jesus said, it is from the heart that all manner of badness comes. And so we focus so much on behavior and behavior modification, but God is always focusing on the heart, always. For example, when I hear preachers going on and on about the dangers, for instance, of pornography, and they'll preach sermon series on this stuff, and I always want to scream, 
Okay, whenever I hear this stuff, I always want to stand up and scream. Do you think people don't know this? I mean, every person in this room who struggles with lust isn't confused about whether it's right or wrong. Their problem is they can't stop even though they know they need to. They feel defeated and ashamed. So just ranting and raving about bad behavior does nothing. Nothing. In fact, oftentimes it reinforces the problem. It makes people hide in darker corners. It makes people walk away. It makes people give up. Um, so here's a basic principle that you've probably already figured out, but because we're so stubborn, we'll spend the rest of our lives learning this lesson. You can never change a person by telling them what to do, ever. It's literally impossible, okay? You can never change a person simply by telling them what to do. If you believe people change by moral exhortation, you will be discouraged and frustrated constantly. Constantly. People don't change by being told that they need to change. People don't change by being educated on right and wrong. People don't change by being critiqued, called out, or corrected. That's not how change happens in the human heart. I mean, being corrected might show someone that they need to change. Correction is not a bad thing. But to assume that correction carries the power to change people is a massive misnomer. It is, uh, it's a wrong assumption. Uh, real heart change comes from hearing over and over and over again that you are loved no matter what. That's how change happens. And that's what Paul's talking about in these verses that I read, 2 Corinthians 8. He's describing the Macedonians, and apparently these people are broken down and impoverished. But Paul went there and told them about the love and grace of God for them, that they don't need to clean up their act in order to be made right with God, that they don't have to become a certain kind of person or do certain things in order to be accepted and loved by God. And that message gripped their heart. He was making it clear, Paul was, that God was always for the underdog, that he only uses broken down people because broken down people are all that there are. And that gripped them their heart, and their response to that was to be incredibly generous. I love the juxtaposition of this phrase. Uh, they are, verse 2, they are being tested by many troubles, and they are very poor, but they are also filled with abundant joy. I mean, those things typically don't go hand in hand. Uh, if you are being tested by many troubles and you're very poor, typically that isn't accompanied by abundant joy. But when God's love and God's grace grips your heart, not changes your behavior, grips your heart, things start to change without you even trying um, Paul describes the Macedonians' response to grace in terms of freedom and spontaneity and, and joy. It was love that changed their hearts, which led then to instinctive, reflexive, and spontaneous generosity. It wasn't Paul saying, hey, listen, man, you guys are being pretty stingy with the few pennies you have. Don't you understand that all that you have comes from God? You should be giving to God's work. He didn't say any of that stuff. He just told them about God's amazing grace and God's love, God's generosity toward them. And then he left the results up to God, whatever God wanted to do with that stuff. Uh, he wasn't trying to change them. You know, the best preaching is not, here's what's wrong and here's what you need to do about it. Okay, that's a lot of preaching these days. Here's what's wrong and here's what you need to do about it. Here's what's wrong with your relationships and here's what you need to do about it. Here's what's wrong with your life and here's what you need to do about it. Here's what's wrong with our country and this is what you need to do about it. I mean, the, the best preaching is not, here's what's wrong and here's what you need to do about it, but rather, here's what's wrong and here's what God has done about it for you. And then just leaving it there. 
Anything that a preacher says or implies after it is finished is an exercise in unbelief. It's like, I don't trust that those potent, powerful words and the reality that those words convey has power to do anything, so I have to add to it. When I was in graduate school, in one of my preaching classes, I remember a a professor saying, as a preacher, it's your job to unpack and explain the text. Uh, And while that's an important part of preaching, preaching really doesn't become preaching until you apply it, call for application. And at the time, I thought that was, you know, that that was right and true. Now I realize that's ridiculous. The only application I care about is the application of God's love to us. Not some application of what I should go out. We know that stuff. We know that things like love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness are all good things. We know that those are the things we should be about. Our problem is that we oftentimes don't do that stuff. We look at our lives and we're like, we're we're not those kinds of people. We should be. And I feel guilty and ashamed that I'm not. But man, the struggle's real. And I just can't seem to pull it off. I can't do this stuff. The things that I know I should do, I don't do. And the things that I know I shouldn't do, those are the things I keep on doing. And then Paul concludes uh, by saying, oh, wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Honesty, radical self-awareness that the apostle Paul had. So the only message that brings about heart change is Here's what's wrong. Here's what's wrong with you. Here's what's wrong with me. Here's what's wrong with this world. Here's what's wrong with your relationships. Here's here's what's wrong. And here's what God has done about it for you. That's the message that changes hearts. That's the only message that produces things like love, joy. Things like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, you know, the fruit of the spirit stuff. The, the, the thing that produces that, love, telling people to love doesn't produce love. Telling people to be more patient isn't what produces patience. I think it was uh, the memoirist, Mary Carr, who said, telling people to relax has worked zero times in human history, okay? <laughs> telling people to do something or to become something isn't what causes them to do or become those things, When we talk about the grace of God, the love of God, the forgiveness of God, the friendship of God, the care and protection of God, when we soak in the hot tub of that stuff, all of a sudden we realize over time we become a little softer, a little bit more pliable, a little bit more forgiving, a little bit more loving, a little bit more patient, a little bit more joyful. We don't... We don't begin to develop the fruits of the Spirit by talking about the fruits of the Spirit. (laughs) We develop those things over time because God is developing those things in us through the message of his love and grace and forgiveness for us. So it is always love, not law, that is the essence of any lasting change that takes place in human experience. Ironically... The people that God has used to change me the most are the people who haven't tried to change me at all. They just have loved me, regardless of how broken, messed up I may be. They haven't tried to change me. In fact, the people, you can probably testify to this too, the people in your life that are always trying to change you, you know it doesn't work. You want to get as far away from those people as possible. Um, Remember, It's God's job to change people. It's our job to love them. That's what my granddad told my mom. I've told you that story before. Uh, My mom accompanied my grandfather to the 75th anniversary of Time Magazine, and because my granddad had been on the cover numerous times, they invited him to come, and it was right in the middle of the whole uh, Lewinsky scandal when Bill Clinton was president. And uh, the organizers uh, had put my granddad next to, had, had basically they had planned to put my granddad at the president's table. And then a week before the, a week before the event, um, the organizers called my granddad and said, hey, based on what's going on with the president and our desire to preserve your reputation, we're going to put you at another table. 
And my granddad's people responded and said, um, he doesn't want to sit at another table. In fact, if you put him at another table, he's not coming. And the reason isn't because he wanted to sit next to the president. He had been friends with every president since Harry Truman, okay? That wasn't the issue. His point was, listen, uh, the, God that, the God that loves me ate with sinners. So will I. I'm no better than him just because my sin looks different than his. And so when it was all done, um, my mom and granddad were driving back to the hotel after the event. And my mom said, Dad, like, what are we supposed to do in situations like this? You know, like, we, we know that the president's guilty of whatever they're saying he's guilty of with this intern. And, you know, how, how are we supposed to respond? And my granddad, with typical simplicity, said, honey, it's God's job to change people. It's our job to simply love them. That's it. I mean, that is huge, man. Think about how different your relationships would be and feel if you really believe that. If you and I really believe that we can't change anybody, we can't fix anybody, we can't ultimately solve other people's deepest problems, if we actually believe that and just simply love them, and leave the fixing and changing and all that stuff up to God. Think about how much freer our relationships would feel. Think about the, the air of unconditionality that we would be breathing in and how life-giving that would be. Um, it's our, and what's, what's interesting, and this is typically how it works, is that, yes, it's God's job to change people and it's our job to love them, but it's typically our love for them that God uses to change them. We think that telling people to change changes them. Loving people in the middle of their unfixedness carries the only hope we have that that person might be fixed in some ways. Well, that simplifies my relationship with everybody in this world. I don't need to change anybody. I can't change anybody. I don't need to fix anybody. I can't fix anybody. That's why I won't tell you what to do. Okay, if you haven't figured out by now that lying and cheating and, uh, you know, that stuff is bad and destructive, if you haven't figured that stuff out by now, I, I can't help you, okay? That's, I mean, God will have to help you figure that stuff out. But like I mentioned a few minutes ago, in Romans 2, Paul says, down deep, every human knows that stuff. Every human. That's why C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity, gives this beautiful killer illustration about how we all know what's right and wrong, what's true and false, almost by instinct. God put his law in our hearts, and he said, just watch children on a playground. If they're standing in line to go down the slide and one child cuts another child in line, the child that was cut will say, well, hold on a second, that's not fair. Now, where do they get this idea of fairness? What's fair, what's not fair, what's right, what's wrong? You can't cut in line, that's wrong. They're appealing to something that they already know to be true. Well, that's true for all of us, every single one of us. So I don't preach to fix people. If you came here to be fixed, you're going to be sorely disappointed by the things that I might say. I don't preach to improve people. I don't preach to change people. I preach to tell people that God loves them no matter what. And I leave all the fixing, improving, and changing up to God. That's his business, not mine. So how you live, what you do, what you choose not to do isn't going to change the way I feel about you. That's, that's God's business. And it, it sort of protects the people around us from us becoming busybodies, micromanagers, you know, morality police. Who likes being around those people? I mean, I don't like being around those people. Uh, one of the things that I love about the vault, okay, which is our weekly men's gathering, we call it the vault because, as you've heard me say before, what's said there stays there. I have discovered that the primary purpose of the vault is for me, okay? I didn't think that was the primary purpose when it started. But I leave there feeling so free and feeling so alive because I can come undone and nobody blinks. Nobody's giving advice. Nobody's correcting. Nobody's trying to solve problems. They're just listening and giving me a space to be me in all of my brokenness. 
And that's true for the other guys that go. So I, I, um, I think this truth protects us and protects the people around us from us becoming busybodies, constantly trying to tinker and tweak with the people around us to make them more of what we want them to be. I've said this before, but every attempt on our part to fix someone else is ultimately an attempt to fix ourselves. What we're saying is, I need you to become a certain way if I'm going to be happy. I need you to become a certain way if I'm going to feel safe and secure. And that doesn't work. We don't fall in love with people who say, love me better. We fall in love with people who say, I love you no matter what. That's how love is birthed. That's how love happens. Um, so if your goal for people is to improve them, to change them, to fix them, they won't be improved, changed, or fixed. In fact, you'll end up pushing them away. Because, like I said, none of us like being around anyone who's always trying to fix us, always giving advice, always offering solutions when we come to them with problems. There's a reason why Proverbs says, be quick to listen and slow to speak. Or as John Stott once said, God gave us two ears and one mouth so that we would listen twice as much as we talk. And yet we're constantly wanting to solve problems. Someone comes to us with a problem. Someone comes to us and unburdens themselves because of something that they're feeling that's causing guilt or shame or whatever. And we immediately jump into counselor mode, advising. And to be honest with you, when people do that with me, it makes me feel so much less than. I'm like, I'm not looking for you to solve all my problems as if you've got it all figured out. There's an air of self-righteousness that exists in people who are constantly giving advice. Constantly. Um, just listen. Give people the space to unburden themselves, to tell the truth about themselves. And when the truth that they disclose is haunting, don't blink. Don't walk away. Don't leave. Um, but if your goal is to love people no matter what, you might just discover that loving them does improve them a little bit, that loving them does change them a little bit, that loving them does fix some things about them. But then again, maybe not. <laughs> That's God's business, not ours. Ours is to simply love it's God's business to do what he wants with that. Change is always the fruit of love, not the other way around. Our world and oftentimes our relationships work in the wrong direction. It's my love for you will grow as you change and become more of what I want you to be, who I think I need you to be. But in God's economy, it's backwards. It's, it's upside down. Change is always the fruit of love. Not the root of it. It's not what causes love. Um, evangelism is the word that Christians have historically used to describe sharing their faith in an attempt to convert someone. Some of you are familiar with that word. Others may not be. But it's, it's the word that, that Christians have historically used to describe sharing their faith with somebody in an attempt to convert them. And over the years, there have been a lot of programs developed to help Christians share their faith in order to convert people. And some of them are mildly helpful tools, but I don't like any of them. And I've never used any of them, ever. Um, and there's a, there's a reason why. Why is it that I don't like that stuff? Well, because it turns loving people and befriending people into a bait-and-switch business transaction. That's what it does. It's, my interest in you has an end. And the end is your conversion, you believing what I believe. Um, but my interest in you, the reason I hate this stuff, that, that stuff... Okay, I'm not saying that it hasn't been used and it isn't helpful. Maybe you've been helped by it, and I don't want to decry that stuff, okay? If God can use crooked sticks, okay? Uh, as my mom used to say, if God can speak through Balaam's ass, he can speak through you and me and the stupid tools we use, okay? Um, ass is King James Version for donkey. 
My mom loved using the King James Version because it gave her a biblical justification to cuss. Right, mom? I know you're watching. You know it's true. Um, my mom was really good at like, um, like low-grade cuss words, you know? I improved mightily upon that as I got older. I would go for the queen mother of all cuss words on a regular basis. And uh, we'll be doing that again this afternoon if the cowboys get behind. Um, but the reason I don't like that stuff is because my interest in you is not to make you believe what I believe. My interest in you is you. That's it. Let God do whatever he wants to do through whatever kind of relationship we have. But it's not my desire to change you. It's, uh, it's like I said, those tools are often used in a business transactional kind of way. And, and it's kind of like I'm, I'm approaching you to have a conversation with you because I want something to happen. Instead of saying, I'm approaching you and I want to have a conversation with you just because I'm interested in you, because you're a fellow human being, and, that, and that's, that's, that's what I care about. My interest in you is not to get you to believe what I believe. My interest in you is, is you. Um, I was uh, asked at dinner maybe six months ago, I was sitting with somebody, and they said, I have a question for you. How do you tell people about God? Like, what's your approach? What's your approach? You know, you're, you, you, you meet somebody who doesn't know God or doesn't believe in God. Like, how, how, do, you, how do you weave that into the conversation? Okay. Um, and I think he was surprised when I looked at him and I said, I don't. <laughs> I, I don't ever do that. Um, and he was like, well, what, do you, what do you mean you don't do that? And I said, listen, this is, this is my approach, okay? Uh, whatever people God brings into my orbit, I do my best to, to love them. I invest in them. I care about them. I ask questions about their lives. I listen to what they have to say. I share my life with them. Um, and then I wait. And he said, what do, you, what do you wait for? I said, because this is a messed up world. And we are messed up people. And life is a roller coaster of ups and downs. And eventually all of us get to a point where we come to the end of our own resources and we wonder, what, like, where is my help going to come from? I've tried everything. I've done everything. Things seem to be falling apart. I can't get it together. I don't, I, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to turn. I said, and if I've... If I've loved these people simply because I love them, if I've befriended them simply because I enjoy their friendship, if I've listened to them because I genuinely care, then chances are when you know what hits the fan, they're going to come to me. They're, they'll, they'll come to me. Uh, and I'll have an appropriate opportunity to go, I can't tell you what to do or what to believe, but let me tell you what's helped me. Let me tell you about the only thing that has gotten me to where I am. Not all of my hard work and pulling myself up on my bootstraps. I tried that stuff. Uh, and everything I've tried to manage on my own seems to fall apart. So I can't, I can't do it, but my hope comes from another place, another person. See, the best thing I can do for someone is to simply be the kind of friend that makes people feel safe and loved so that when they finally recognize their need for help, they know they can come to me. No judgment. No corrections, no unsolicited advice. Well, that's what, that's what I want the sanctuary to be. That's what I believe in my gut that God wants the sanctuary to be. I, um, I get a, uh, an email every morning um, from Frederick Beekner, who's dead, but uh, he was a writer, and his, his people, uh, if you subscribe to their thing, uh, they send you a bit of his stuff every morning to read. And so I read it every morning. Um, and this is what, and I want to close with this. This, is, this comes from a book of his called Whistling in the Dark. And this is what he said. Alcoholics Anonymous, or AA, 
is the name of a group of men and women who acknowledge that addiction to alcohol is ruining their lives. Their purpose in coming together is to give it up and help others do the same. And they realize they can't pull this off by themselves. They believe they need each other and they believe they need God. And the ones who aren't so sure about God speak instead of their higher power. When they first start talking at a meeting, they introduce themselves by saying, I am John, I'm an alcoholic. I am Mary, I'm an alcoholic. To which the rest of the group answers each time in unison. Hi, John. Hi, Mary. They are apt to end with the Lord's Prayer or the Serenity Prayer. Apart from that, they have no ritual. They have no hierarchy. They have no dues. They have no budget. They do not advertise and they don't proselytize. Having no buildings of their own, they meet wherever they can. Nobody lectures them and they don't lecture each other. They simply tell their own stories with the candor that anonymity makes possible. They tell where they went wrong and how day to day they are trying to go right. They tell where they find the strength and understanding and hope to keep trying. Sometimes one of them will take special responsibility for another to be available at any hour of day or night if the need arises. There's not much more to it than that. And it seems to be enough. Healings happen. You can't help thinking that something like this is what the church is meant to be. And maybe once was before it got to be big business. Sinners Anonymous. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it, is the way St. Paul put it, speaking for all of us. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. I am me. I am a sinner. Hi, you. Hi, every Sadie and Sal. Hi, every Tom, Dick, and Harry. It is the forgiveness of sins, of course. It is what the church is all about. No matter what far place alcoholics end up in, either in this country or virtually anywhere else, they know that there will be an AA meeting nearby to go to, and that at that meeting they will find strangers who are not strangers to help and to heal, to listen to the truth and to tell it. That is what the church should be about. Would it ever occur to Christians in a far place to turn to a church nearby in hope of finding the same? Would they find it? If not, then you have to wonder, what is so big about the church's business? Whew. I read that this morning and I thought, that's just perfect. That's who I want us to be. It's the only thing I want us to be, honestly. Um, there, are, there are places where you can go and get involved in this program or that program. There are churches whose doors are open every night of the week so that you can do the things that they do, the program, participate in the programs that they have. And I'm not decrying any of that stuff. That's just not who we are. <laughs> uh, we have groups like this, like the one that... Frederick Beekner described. We have groups like this that meet here on a regular basis throughout the week. And then we gather here on Sunday mornings. This is the largest recovery group in our church. Sunday mornings is the largest recovery group in our church. We meet in smaller packs with other people throughout the week, but this is, this is who we are. And I'm not sure I would have come to that conclusion had I not crashed and burned myself. I think I recognized at the bottom that I needed this too that I wasn't gonna make it if I didn't have a safe place where I could find refuge and sanctuary even in telling the truth about myself, that I would never make it through life the way that I had done for the first 40 years if I tried to do it that way for the next 40 years. And usually it takes crashing and burning or coming to the end of ourselves, bottoming out in some way. It doesn't have to be anything catastrophic or anything major, just sort of bumping up against the wall of our own resources or lack thereof, to realize, I need God. I'm not even sure I know who this God is or what he's about. I just know I need something beyond myself, and I need other people. I need other people around me, people who understand the dark because they've been there themselves, people who understand what it smells like in the gutter because they've smelled it themselves. Those are the people that I want to be around. Those are the people that I need to be around. Those are the people that we all need to be around. So as I said last week, the difficult thing is not um, being there for people who know they're in recovery. It's convincing people who think they're not in recovery that they actually are, that they're weaker 
and more frail than they think they are, um, that they're more prone to selfishness than they think they are, that they're not as valiant as they think they are, that they're not as strong and capable as they think they are. There is so much freedom in finally accepting our limitations, finally admitting the hard truth about ourselves that we can't make it on our own. There is so much freedom in that, which is a direct connection to what Jesus himself said. I have come, my whole mission, the whole reason I have come is to set people free. So if you ask yourself, well, what is God doing in my life? I know you might be asking that because you're facing some decisions or there are certain things that you're trying to figure out. I, I get that. But ultimately, what God is doing in your life, and he's doing the same thing in all of our lives, is setting us free. And the reason that tends to be a painful process is because he has to first convince us of those areas in which we're not free. And we struggle against that. We, we don't want to believe that stuff about ourselves. Um, and yet God loves us too much to let us believe a delusion. And so he gets us to the point, maybe even allows circumstances in our lives to get us to the point where we realize I'm, I'm weaker than I thought I was. I don't love the way I ought to. I'm impatient. Uh, it doesn't have to be, like I said, anything catastrophic. It can just be this, I'm, I'm just not, there's something missing. And no matter how hard I try to fill those voids in my life, they just keep getting deeper and darker. I need help. That's ultimately what prayer is. It's simply saying, help. We need that. I need it. Let's pray together. God, thank you for your mercies, which are new every morning. I'd be screwed without it. In Jesus' name, amen.